<laughs> Hello. So yes, I lead the uh, data sciences group at uh, the NASA Ames Research Center. And you know, given the talk yesterday, please do not confuse NASA with the NSA, the National Security Agency. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, machine learning for aviation safety at NASA. It will be kind of an overview talk, but I'll have a listing for some papers at the end. Uh, um, so we have within um, the NASA Aeronautics a project called system-wide safety. And as it implies, the idea is to look at safety for the system as a whole in the sense of all of the aircraft, the, the airspace together, individual aircraft as they're operating, uh, even in uh, issues happening at individual airlines. And the... Uh, there are several what are called technical challenges in areas like software verification and validation. We're starting to look, look more and more at urban air mobility, but most of the machine learning work we have is part of this technical challenge called integrated risk assessment for the terminal area. And the idea there is to develop tools that will collect data from the different parts of the aviation system, analyze them, and then uh, allow for visualization into various dashboards for different uh, parties that are involved to do risk assessment. And we really at, at NASA cover the whole, the range from monitor through to assessment. We do not really do much in the area of mitigation. We mostly leave that to the carriers and then regulators like the US Federal Aviation Administration. So we are interested in looking for incidents and incidents are not necessarily individual snapshots in time. They really range from some kind of a context which by itself is safe, but where you're more likely to have some kind of a degeneracy in the system, ultimately going through maybe to compromised states, anomalous states, and then maybe something like an accident. This, every step of the degeneration has a pretty low probability of happening, but it is still higher than a baseline probability, which is why we are, are interested in this. So the main, there are many different types of data we could examine. Mostly we have uh, focused on flight data monitoring or what uh, we in the US tend to call flight operations quality assurance. So these are data recorded on board the aircraft and also trajectory or radar track data. But we have looked a little bit at aviation safety reports and then a tiny bit at, in, in, at weather. And then we're also now starting to broaden out into what you might call non-traditional data sources. So we had a brief project looking at pilot blogs, for example, to try and see if there's any kind of a leading indicator there of any issues that are likely to pop up in the future. Now, the main types of problems we've been looking at so far are anomaly detection. So this is really looking for individual problems at a given point in time. And then precursor identification where given some kind of a problem at the end, like say an anomalous state or even an incident kind of towards the end, we want to find what are those precursors like I described earlier, you know, what are the conditions under which you are more likely to have those downstream problems. And then within aviation, I won't end up describing this much, but we've done some uh, classification of aviation safety reports into a, a pre-established set of types or trying to also find what seem to be the key topics represented in a large safety report repository. So I probably don't need to trumpet this all that much, but the, the upshot here of what we're trying to do is kind of the opposite of the normal exceedance-based methods, where here we're really trying to make the data speak for themselves and find those, oper those statistical anomalies within which we expect operational anomalies to tend to take place, um, mainly because we can look at the opposite perspective and we can say, probably given how safe the aviation system is, the data points that are statistically normal are going to be operationally normal, so we can quickly throw those out and then just try within the statistical anomalies, obviously throw out those false alarms, but then ultimately especially try to find these unknown problems. And we have had a bit of a history with carriers where we've used data-driven methods. Yeah, I had some false alarms that irritated people a little bit, but then we found some useful insights and one carrier did tell us that they made changes to their daily exceedance method uh, or daily exceedance detection based on insights that are algorithm derived. So unknown is what we're interested in looking for. This is an example of the kind of thing we have found. So in this particular flight, there was a drop in airspeed for about 30 seconds 
during takeoff, and this one got to within 12 knots of stall speed. We did not actually tell the algorithm anything about what we're looking for or even what stall speed is, but this particular anomaly got pretty high up on the list. There were other examples of drops in airspeed, but where those were lower on the list because they did not drop for as long or as, as low in airspeed. Um, the same algorithm that we used for that uh, earlier anomaly with continuous data, we were able to use that here to find a, a discrete anomaly. In this case, this is uh, the flight crew and the autopilot fighting over whether the aircraft should be in, in vertical speed or altitude hold mode. Ultimately, the pilot got fed up and just decided to recycle the flight director. So it was found as anomalous because of this unusual amount of switching that took place. And then this, uh, what I've sh shown so far is from flight recorded data, so the flight, da uh, flight data monitoring. This is from an example from trajectory data. So this is a case of a landing at uh, the JFK airport in New York. So the aircraft came along this way, overshot the runway, was not able to line up for approach in time, so had to actually go around. And you can maybe barely see that he actually overshot the runway a second time but this time was able to stabilize in time. So this particular flight was found as anomalous just because the trajectory is of an unusual shape overall. Again, we did not tell, tell it what normal really is beyond just saying, okay, these other ones seem to represent normal trajectories and find something that looks funny. Now, the algorithm that we use to find the anomalies that I showed so far is uh, multiple kernel anomaly detection. And the basic idea is that you have these different modalities of data, right? Discrete sequences with you know, autopilot modes, button pushes in some cases. We have continuous measures like altitude, airspeed, and the like. Now, you cannot just throw all those up on a Cartesian coordinate plane and cluster them and find which are the data points that seem to stick out, right? The coordinate systems are entirely different. So the idea here is to use kernel functions, which are basically measures of similarity, to map all these different data spaces into the space of similarity where zero means maximally different, one means maximally similar. And so then you can find how similar every <coughs> pair of flights is based on all these different modalities separately using an appropriate kernel function, then you take a convex combination and you have this overall measure of similarity. And of course, we're assuming here that if a, if a flight is similar to most other flights, it probably represents normal behavior. Otherwise, it represents anomalous behavior. And so what we're sorting out here is just how to measure similar diff or different across all these different uh, modalities of data. And this is just a... I don't know how much we should bask in the glory of equations like this in a talk setting, but just to show that there is something here, uh, this is essentially the formulation of the, uh, the one class support vector machine, and we're able to throw multiple kernels in here depending on the modalities of data you have available. So we've worked with discrete and continuous for the, uh, the FDM data. Uh, we've only done a tiny bit of work with text with reports that have been attached to the, the flights. And then we were able to use the same underlying algorithm for the trajectory data, obviously, with different kernels. Now, I mean, I, I kind of glossed over this problem of there being false positives in our anomaly detection. Obviously, we want to suppress those and not irritate our, our friends at the carriers. So we've been implementing this approach to, to active learning uh, where you probably know the idea of active learning is to respect the fact that there's a cost to providing labels. And so we want to ask the domain experts whether the anomalies we find are operationally significant or not, but we want to ask as little as we can, can manage and you know, not, not bother our domain experts. So the idea here is that we, we have a set of flights that let's say you know, have, we, they're rank ordered based on what the anomaly detection algorithm says are um, uh, anomalous or normal towards the bottom. But then we get an initial set of flights for which we ask the domain expert, are they actually operationally significant or not? And so we, we learn an initial classifier that way. But then at every point, we then ask the question, which is the flight for which we would get the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, biggest reduction in the false alarm by getting a label. So we get that, a lot, ask the, the expert to review, then update the classifier based on that, then again ask, okay, which is the next best flight to review, have the domain expert review it, et cetera. And just until, until our pilot gets irritated, we just go as much as we can and keep, and keep updating uh, the classifier. And then the idea, of course, is that for any new example, 
if the anomaly detection algorithm says that the flight is normal, we don't bother anymore, it's normal. If it says that, that, that the flight is statistically anomalous, then we ask the classifier, okay, is it operationally significant or not? If it's operationally significant, probably go off and do something. If not, either just don't bother with it or if the domain expert has time, provide feedback. And that feedback is provided in the form of a user interface that we developed here. So once a flight is selected, then the, the domain expert can pull up plots of whatever variables he wants. And in this case, it, the, the user interface shows not only the variables, but then for each variable shows uh, what you see as the dotted lines, which is the 10th to 90th percentile range for that variable, which may be of use. Uh, what's shown in red is something that just we're highlighting. The user interface doesn't actually have that. But the domain expert can review this and then can also enter a rationale. So this rationale here is, is what he entered. It's pretty small, so I wrote it up here a little bit bigger. And so this is just his way of saying, okay, yeah, this particular air flight is operationally significant, and here's why. And right now what we do with this is very simple. We actually just look for uh, words in here that's, that uh, correspond to features that are already in the data set. And then we use that to maybe derive new features that are then used by the classifier. But we're thinking down the line, we can probably use some more sophisticated text processing to just where maybe the domain expert can describe a sequence of events and we can actually learn something from that. So there's uh, quite a few numbers here, but we, we did a little test of this just uh, to, to see how well it works. So our, we have a rather patient domain expert. We got him to actually label all 98 of the flights that showed up towards the top of the anomaly list from our anomaly detection algorithm. And he determined that 20 of those are operationally significant and 78 of those are not. So then in the future when we're testing things, we are just able to pretend that we can instantly get a label on any example that we want uh, and, and then test out how well our algorithm's working. And what this one shows is just for the original anomaly detection algorithm, MCAD, as opposed to with active learning, what does, what does each, of, uh, each algorithm show as the top 46 flights and how many of them are actually operationally significant. Of course, we want as many operationally significant as possible. And the point here is that the, with the active learning, we ended up with four more operationally significant flights within the top 46 compared to what MCAD did, and then we have fewer false positives within the top 46. Um, obviously, still quite a ways to go, but uh, at least we got some improvement, which is a, a first step. Now, what I've described are, so far are looking for anomalies, so just at individual snapshots in time. Now, we're interested also in finding precursors. So in particular, we have a notion of what's you know, a hazard state that we're interested in. We're trying to find what is that point furthest back in time at which you can say the system kind of branched off towards having a higher than desirable probability of going to the hazard state as opposed to the safe state. Now, we're also interested though in finding, say, corrective actions where you're getting back on a good track, or I don't know, you can call these degenerating actions maybe, or you're getting back to a hazard state. So we're really interested in finding all of these. And this is an example of the kind of thing we might find. So we here, we asked the algorithm for precursors to go around. And in this particular flight, it happened to find the case where the ground speed was unusually high, uh, going beyond what's shown in gray, which is normal for that, that particular distance out from the runway. And then this particular flight also happened to have a, a rather strong vertical closing speed to the nearest flight. So you can imagine both of those coming along and then the aircraft being directed to go around based on that. Now I won't go much into this, but the, there, there are two algorithms we have for, uh, for precursor identification. One of them essentially uses inverse reinforcement learning to learn from that massive amount of normal good flight data we have and it reuses reinforcement learning to learn from those few examples of bad flights that we have. And what we're really looking for uh, as precursors are those states where one action has a much higher value than another, where you can say that that second action probably is a precursor to reaching a low reward state down the line, which would be the undesirable effect. So, um, there's the second algorithm, which I won't end up going into, uses a, a multiple instance learning framework, and we added the deep temporal neural nets on top of that to be able to bring temporal learning to, to multiple instance learning, which hasn't happened so far. 
but essentially we, we, we have a lot of uh, upcoming work. So do we of course have you know, a lot more testing to do? You saw from the nature of the results that there's uh, certainly room for improvement. We'd like to be able to incorporate multiple anomaly detection algorithms. We've already tested quite a few active learning strategies, but certainly there are more that we can do. We've only had one domain expert provide labels at any point. We of course want multiple domain expert labels. Um, for precursor identification, we have an ongoing work on an autoencoder based algorithm. Uh, and then as far as uh, text, we actually need for some kind of sustained effort. It's been kind of hit or miss based on the funding that we had. Uh, at NASA, we have an aviation safety reporting system where we've used redacted reports so far, but there's the possibility for us to be able to use unredacted for a while. And, and, and I mentioned all, or a little bit earlier about uh, the desire to use non-traditional data sources. So sorry that was rather whirlwind, but please feel free to contact me here or and also should you need any good reading for the flights back home, please feel free to look these up or ask me for them. Thank you.